Okay, let's get started. Um, good morning and welcome everyone. We're really delighted to have you join us this morning for this online webinar. I'm Ashley Bourne. I'm the Executive Director of Sustainable Conservation, and we're a nonprofit organization that brings Californians together to solve our state's toughest environmental challenges. This webinar is part of our Check In and Connect series. Let me see if I can get my slides to work. Hold on one moment. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, this, is, this webinar is part of our Check In and Connect series. Like you, we're working from home, caring for children, cooking more than normal, and running our lives apart. So for the moment, we're unable to meet in person. So we've launched this web series as part of our Check In and Connect campaign in order to provide you with opportunities to stay engaged with us and our partners like Turtle Island Restoration Network. Anytime we can connect around issues we all care about and celebrate the work we're collectively doing to make California a better place, we all win as a community. So please continue to check in and connect with our community through our webinars, blog, happy hours, and websites. There are plenty of ways to get involved and support our work, so follow the link you see on this page um, to see how you can get involved. Joining me today is Preston Brown, a watershed biologist and director of watershed conservation with Turtle Island Restoration Network. Preston is gonna talk with you about one of the network's fantastic restoration efforts on Lagunitas Creek. And then I'll talk about sustainable conservation's efforts to make projects like the networks much easier and less expensive to implement. After each of us speaks, we'll open it up for questions from you. But before we start the program, I wanna go over a few logistics. First of all, we have you all in listen-only mode. As Preston and I present, please enter any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I'll monitor that box and I'll ask Preston questions at the end of his remarks, and then I'll also take questions at the end of my remarks. Um, Preston and I right now have our video off, but we'll turn our video on so you can see us when we get to that, those Q&A sections. If you've got any technical issues with Zoom, please let us know through the chat chat box also at the bottom of your screen and our colleague Hannah will help you. And then I want to let you know that we're recording this webinar so we'll send you a link to it in a follow-up email and we'll also send you a survey which we really hope you'll fill out so that we can continue to improve these webinars. So before we get started let's do a poll to learn about who's listening in today. Um, our first question is where are you calling in from today? Great, we've got quite a few of you responding. Why don't we sh share these poll results? Um, as I thought might happen, we've got quite a few of you from Marin County, which is great since this project's in Marin, and then also um, from other parts of the Bay Area and, and looks like across the state, which is, which is great. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, let's put up the second question. What is your affiliation with sustainable conservation? wasn't quite the question I was expecting, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, so let's share the results of this one, which actually was whether you had heard about us before the webinar, and uh, you know, the vast majority of you had, but um, a number of you had not. So um, let's go to our last question. Um, had you heard of Turtle Island Restoration Network before this webinar? And if you had, are you a member? Well, it's close to 50. Oh, let's, sorry, let's share the results. <laughs> it looks about, it's about almost 
half of you uh, had heard about Turtle Island before and half not, so you're in for a treat. For those of you who have not heard about this organization and their good work, and uh, you may want to consider being a member after you, you hear about the work. Okay, um, let me tell you a little bit more about Preston before I turn it over to him. Uh, Preston's a watershed biologist and is focused on developing and facilitating stream restoration projects and salmon monitoring programs. Before working for Turtle Island, Preston worked as an ecologist with the Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, where his work focused on vegetation management, ranch land restoration, and habitat map mapping. So with that, Preston, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Ashley, and welcome, everyone. I will pull up my presentation. Okay, well, great, thank you for joining. So again, my name is Preston Brown. I direct Spawn's Watershed Conservation Program. So Spawn is a project of Turtle Island Restoration Network. Turtle Island is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting and recovering highly migratory endangered marine species. So we, we have an office in Marin County where our headquarters is. We also have an office in Texas and partners in Central and South America. Our work is, has taken us all around the globe uh, with a focus in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, Gulf of Mexico, and off our California coast. Spawn, the local project, is involved with recovering the endangered coho salmon of Marin County, where roughly 20% of the wild Central California coast coho reside. So our mission is to restore these species uh, through advocacy, policy, habitat restoration, science and monitoring, and hands-on volunteer and advocacy. So this project is the Lagunitas Creek Floodplain and Riparian Restoration Project. This is Spawn's largest project to date and has involved many partners, many organizations over the course of several years. This project just recently completed its second phase and the uh, presentation I'm gonna show you this morning highlights results and, and methods uh, for uh, the whole phase and uh, most photos and videos are from uh, the first phase. So let's get into it. So this project is located on federal land. It's the Golden Gate National Recreation Area is the landowner. The National Park Service is the, is the, the landowner and managing agency. This project includes uh, two, two sites uh, about a half a mile apart and site one and site two were done in different phases, uh, but largely uh, these, these two projects combine uh, one mile of creek uh, and involve removing hardscapes and infrastructure from the riparian corridor, uh, a lot of cement, retaining walls and debris, installing large woody debris features excavating and creating off-channel habitats and restoring the riparian corridor with native plants and trees. And this project is located in the middle section of the, of the Lagunitas Creek watershed where floodplains and off-channel habitats support the limiting factors for juvenile coho. So this map on the left shows the two project sites, site one on the left and site two on the right. Site one was done in 2018 and site two was just completed in 2019. This is the mile stretch of creek that, that I mentioned. These two project sites are where the majority of the, of the off-channel habitats, the wood structures and the riparian areas uh, were constructed. In total, from feasibility, design, compliance and implementation, this project totaled a little over $3 million and funding came from a variety of sources. The funding primarily came from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the State Coastal Conservancy through their Proposition 1 grant programs and the, and the Fisheries Restoration Grant Program. And funding also came from the 319H uh, TMDL funding from the uh, State Water Board. As Lagunitas is technically impaired for fine sediments, this was a multi-benefit project 
for wildlife, uh, fisheries, and water quality. Of course, the National Park Service, it's a major partner in this effort, and their foresight uh, early on helped us develop the plans and the schedule for the implementation. The construction uh, was done by a firm, Hanford ARC, who's done a lot of this excellent work throughout the, the coast. The designs and the compliance uh, was done by uh, an expert environmental consulting firm, Environmental Science Associates, uh, with expert teams in hydrology, geomorphology, and fisheries. Uh, and, and NOAA Restoration Center uh, was, a, was a partner and funder as well. And of course, members and donors, volunteers of the Turtle Island Restoration Network. The nexus with sustainable conservation came in the form of a programmatic biological opinion prepared by NOAA. So this project was unique in that we, we only used the uh, biological opinion from NOAA as the only programmatic permit. In other words, every other permit we, we were required to receive was done independently, separate, uh, and, and done ourselves. So that is a lot of work. And we're grateful that we were able to use the NOAA biological opinion because it uh, no doubt spread, uh, helped speed up that process and required very little effort on our part to obtain the biological opinion from NOAA. So we're, we're glad that we were able to utilize that opinion and uh, look forward to using other programmatic permits to help this restoration work. And I will say too, it's having a, a restoration project that is uh, very well vetted and, uh, and is a good restoration project, is a great model for uh, using a biological opinion. Uh, so some of the goals for this project included providing habitat for the limiting factors for juvenile coho, which is winter and spring rearing habitats, providing improved sediment metering, storage, and, and uh, sorting on the watershed, improving the riparian habitat and other, other wildlife for endangered species such as the freshwater shrimp. This project involved removing thousands of yards of, of imported fill, cement, concrete, and debris from the riparian corridor, recreating off-channel habitats, floodplains, side channels, uh, installing anchored and unanchored wood pieces, and restoring the riparian corridor with uh, native plants, stakes, and trees from our native plant nursery. So these are some of the photos before. As I mentioned, these sites were two, lo two different locations that were both uh, historic towns. Uh, this town under phase one was called Tokaloma. This was a population of say 50 people. Uh, the National Park Service bought all the land in the 1970s with the foresight to create a national park. The long-term leases that people had expired in the early 2000s, and the land sat vacant. So one of the sites uh, is home to our office, but the rest of the buildings uh, have been removed by the National Park Service that were in great disrepair and falling apart in a public safety hazard as well as an ecological blight. So this is some of the photos of the, the structures there. We had anything from concrete boat ramps to large retaining walls and barbecue pits and outdoor infrastructure, uh, chicken coops and chain link fencing and overhead electrical wires and old propane tanks. Uh, it was as this, this town eventually uh, started to fall apart, uh, all that material started to unravel and ensnare wildlife and uh, crumble into the creek. So it was uh, in great need of being undone and the, the corridor restored. More photos of large concrete pieces, infrastructure that held up the, the thousands of yards of fill that was imported into the floodplain to build these, this village. Uh, large cinder block and concrete retaining walls uh, were 10, 15 feet tall and held back all that dirt. And so we took it uh, upon the project to remove that hardscape, remove the fill, and restore a floodplain that had basically been lost for a century. So the construction took 10 weeks of uh, phase one, and we removed the fill material and uh, 
and disposed of it uh, at a site that was in Petaluma that was actually uh, using the material to recontour their landscape and fill uh, illegal ponds and ditches uh, dug without permits. So the uh, fill that, that was imported was actually used for a, a meaningful purpose. All the concrete and the cement and retaining walls were taken out and taken to a quarry for recycling and the, the landscape was recontoured uh, with large machinery. This is a time-lapse photo uh, video that I will try to play. Uh, bear with me if the internet connection is poor. But, um, so this is an angle showing one of the large sections of the, of the floodplain work. The fill had already been taken out largely, and, and this is a lot of the earth-shaping landscaping work you see. A lot of the wood that you see, uh, these, these pieces of equipment moving, were utilized for the large woody debris structures, both anchored and unanchored pieces. And the machinery here is sculpting the landscape, uh, trying to create uh, distinct channels and floodplain areas that flow during different times of the year. Okay. Uh, more construction. We worked with uh, Hanford ARC was a very, very competent contractor. We were very glad to have them. They were very conscientious of, the, of our needs and were very into uh, field fitting the project to meet the, uh, the design requirements. So this is another uh, series of before and after photos. So in this photo, the photo on the left is of course before the project, photo on the right is, is after the major earthwork. Uh, our, our office is there. The corner of the office is highlighted with the red arrow. The photo on the left shows an outdoor incinerator. This was part of a large uh, outdoor living space with uh, small buildings and a horse paddock and large retaining walls and outdoor barbecue places and, and this incinerator. Uh, so that just uh, was one example of many of the large amount of concrete and, and infrastructure that was in the channel, which was then removed. And on the photo on the right is an off-channel feature that was built and uh, now functions uh, as a perennial side channel. So this photo uh, moving upstream uh, is the photo of some of, there's three buildings there on the left that show uh, that the houses in disrepair prior to their removal in 2016. Uh, the, the houses were all on cement pads and the same angle on the right shows the large redwood tree in the background. Uh, so that's uh, literally the same angle that, uh, that was taken three years after. So the, the photo on the right shows the seasonal channel. That's a channel that flows during the winter and during storm events to provide that off-channel habitat for salmonids, which is the, the limiting factor for salmonids is their, their winter survival. So that channel that we're looking at functions specifically during that time to provide that, that overwinter rearing habitat. Uh, so this, this resulted in over 10,000 yards of debris that was removed from the channel and concrete and retain, uh, cinder block retaining walls that were removed. And this channel was, was uh, dug out and articulated uh, with some winter flows. Uh, and it didn't take long for the project to mature. These photos show of uh, June and uh, March and June uh, following the project last year. So uh, the grass uh, is all native. Uh, we seeded over 20 pounds of grass at the site and a lot of it was uh, sourced from nearby watersheds and within our own watershed and plants and, and shrubs and trees have now uh, started to grow at the site. We have uh, many many species of trees and, and shrubs that are growing along the channels. So the site is recovering really quickly. This is another uh, before and after series. The sycamore tree highlighted with the red arrow shows the, the um, 
back the area behind our office that has a small building foundation uh, there on the left. Uh, that building was was dilapidated and and torn apart, but the foundation remained. Uh, there was also a a, a series of metal uh, irrigation pipes under there. You can see sticking out. That was one example of many uh, where there was infrastructure retaining walls and uh, building foundation still left in place. And the photo on the right shows uh, that same angle with the tree highlighted with all the, the foundation, the concrete removed and the fill uh, removed. And what we have on the right is a perennial off-channel habitat that um, provides overwintering and over summer rearing habitat. Again, the limiting factors for, for Salmonid survival. And then uh, the photo uh, there on the right is from uh, May of last year, which shows uh, just just in a series of months, uh, a lot of the, the vegetation has sprouted and regrown. Uh, we have willows growing all along the channel, and the site is really growing in. And and those flows were were fairly high uh, for for May, but um, uh, you can see some of the willows sticking out of the water there in the bottom. Uh, another interesting aspect of the project was to retain spawning gravel in certain locations. So the photo on the top uh, shows how we created a small alcove, uh, a, a small horseshoe shaped cutout of the creek channel that was very incised and disconnected from its floodplain. We installed some large woody debris structures there and given a couple large storm events, the, the photo below shows the result, which uh, we let the creek do the work and we were able to create a condition where we formed a riffle in a place where there was a, a slow, shallow glide with very little habitat or complexity. And we were able to retain three feet of gravel, that spawning habitat that wasn't there, that's benthic macroinvertebrate habitat, and a lot more complexity, both uh, upstream and downstream as a result of that one riffle. Uh, so that was an experimental site that we're hoping to develop more and carry on uh, work similar to that in, in Lower Lagunitas Creek. Uh, we also put in many large woody debris structures and this photo here shows one log that we anchored uh, at the mouth of, the, of our seasonal, uh, or sorry, our perennial channel. So the photo uh, shows lots and lots of wood debris that naturally racked up as a result of the one log that we put in. And again, we let the creek do the work and rack up the wood and create this amazing wood jam that's still there. That's in the main stem of the creek. And then the creek on the little uh, section on the right is our perennial channel that uh, helps to uh, water, water helps get in there by backing up in front of the wood jam. And, and that's functioned just as we were hoping and uh, has now made it through two winters. So we expect it to be dynamic, of course, uh, but we are, are uh, enjoying the results thus far. This is a, a time-lapse series of a storm event last February of our seasonal channel. So this channel is flowing uh, and then rises as the, as the waters rise. And what we see here is the water is now being able to spill into this floodplain channel. Velocities across the floodplain, across the valley have decreased. Wood is being retained, gravels being retained. Uh, there's a lot more habitat suitable for rearing juvenile coho and steelhead. And what we have here is a multi-stage channel, uh, meaning all that is that when the waters rise at different levels, uh, different areas of the floodplain become engaged depending on the water surface. And so that allows fish uh, to find suitable habitat through the reach, uh, no matter where, uh, how high the water is, because there's always some suitable habitat available as waters rise and fall. And so this, this shows uh, different channels and their, their uh, uh, water surface at different times of the, of the storm event. Moving on, this is a, another time-lapse series of the perennial channel, uh, same storm event, 
and it got uh, very, 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 very close to this camera. <laughs> And so the, you can imagine if you're a small uh, four inch fish trying to survive these large storm events can be a challenge. And that's why the, the theory is that the, the best available science tells us the limiting factor for endangered salmon survival in the watershed is the ability of those young fish to survive winter conditions. And velocity is a big part of that. And as these storm waters rise, you can see how, how quickly that velocity in, uh, increases. And so this video shows how the, the, the seasonal channel coming in from the top of the, of the frame pours into this perennial feature and where they mix, the water is very slow, it's, it's very quiet um, and, and very suitable for rearing habitat. So again, it's that multi-stage channel that has different elevations and when the water comes across it uh, it's able fish are able to survive and i'll point one thing out uh, if you can see my cursor uh, these features here these are um, uh, habitats purposely designed for California freshwater shrimp. California freshwater shrimp are a very rare endangered species, the largest population of which is found in Marin County. Uh, these habitats are basically uh, large burlap uh, rolls suspended over the creek with live willow. And all of these live willow, which look like sticks now in this photo are now uh, maturing willow several feet tall with lots of growth and those are basically overhanging banks and shrimp live on the root tissues of those willows and provide habitat for shrimp and fish and other aquatic wildlife and I'm and I'm uh, proud to say that we actually did find California freshwater shrimp using these habitats through our summer snorkel and that uh, is the first time that uh, it's been documented. People have built habitats specifically for freshwater shrimp uh, that have, have survived uh, and are providing habitat for shrimp. So it's a very low tech, very cost effective approach, but it seems to work. So we applied that to our second phase and this summer we'll also be snorkeling for freshwater shrimp use of that habitat. So overall, the project was very successful. We're still monitoring it. We found uh, many hundreds of coho just in the, juven just in the perennial uh, habitat feature that we can see in the summer. We monitor velocities through the winter and find much of the project is suitable for winter rearing habitat, meaning slow water, and uh, suit suitable depth. We have seen adult coho and steelhead spawn in locations uh, within the project area. And we have a plethora of species uh, that we see utilizing the habitat from terrestrial uh, and amphibians and, and birds and other fish and mammals. So we're very excited about that. And we also uh, are excited to uh, say that we did achieve uh, wood loading targets as discussed in our uh, uh, Lagunitas Creek Sediment TMDL. A goal of that implementation plan uh, is to improve and increase the amount of large woody debris within the stream corridor. And within our project area, we did meet that goal. So with that, uh, I will say, if you haven't seen the project, I'd love to give you a tour. Um, any time of year is great. And if you want to learn more about Spawn and Turtle Island, we have projects from Central America to uh, Costa California and, of course, Marin County. And we need supporters and volunteers to help us do the work and help us save these endangered species because we can't do it ourselves. And it definitely takes a large group. 
So we're eager to partner and find those people willing and interested in helping us in this effort. So with that, I'll, I'll say thank you and I'll turn it back over to Ashley. Great, well, thank you, Preston. And um, I'm gonna, maybe you can share your, turn your video on too. Um, I see we've got a couple questions in the question and answer box. So let me start off. Um, first question, the individual before and after remediations are beautiful and compelling. Can you tell us which of them, maybe all of them were aided specifically by programmatic permitting slash the NOAA biological opinion? So the, uh, if I understood that correctly, uh, the, the, the programmatic permits uh, that we were able to use uh, was the, the biological opinion from NOAA. So the, the uh, other agency permits uh, that we, we had to get were not uh, programmatic. Um, and it did take a lot of time for us to get those. Uh, so the only permit that we, we did receive uh, that was uh, programmatic through sustainable conservation was the biological opinion from NOAA. But I think that uh, biological opinion covers the type of work that you actually did. Oh, of course. So, and, and, yeah. yeah, right. And, right. Then, and in fact, actually, in just in programmatic permits generally, a number of the permits would have covered the work you did, but looking at it from different angles. Correct. And so, and so I guess more specifically, the, the biological opinion from NOAA um, covered us to, to relocate um, salmonids out of the project area uh, to physically handle them. Uh, but also to, to um, uh, do restoration uh, and earthwork uh, within their uh, designated habitat. So building wood structures in the creek channel, for example. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, if there are other questions, please do put them in the Q&A box. Um, and while I wait to see if there's any additional questions, I've got a question for you, Preston. And, and that is, where did all that water go before this restoration project was done? That was a lot of water in those videos. Yeah, we, we actually found uh, it's, a, it's roughly equivalent to 2 million gallons of water. Uh, and all that water uh, stayed within the creek channel. Uh, so before we opened up the, the valley uh, and opened up the floodplain, all that water had to still flow through a narrow, a narrower space. And so uh, that created higher velocities and uh, more likely to, to transport wood and sediment out where now uh, the velocities are slower uh, and the water that's still the same amount of water can just be spread out over a larger area. Okay, we've got another question. What are your monitoring costs annually and what instrument did you use to monitor water velocity? So our monitoring costs are about $5,000 annually. Uh, so that, that costs um, come from staff time uh, to uh, snorkel and to monitor the project through the winter to take uh, before and after photographs to monitor vegetation survival to monitor uh, species occurrence. And so the specific instrument we use for velocities is called a pygmy meter. It's called a USGS approved a pygmy meter, which is just a simple analog uh, meter that has a, a rotating disc. And that rotating disc counts the number of rotations per minute. And that tells us uh, how fast the water is going. And so uh, when it's safe, uh, we, we wade in the creek and take test measurements throughout the, the channel networks. And we're able to use that instrument to correlate it to velocity. Got another question. Um, do you have a sense of how many yearly cohort population cycles? I understand most coho are a one year back and done, but maybe some span multiple years. So uh, how many yearly cohort population cycles will need to monitor to understand when these remediations are clearly having an impact in terms of increased reds? So coho actually have a three year life cycle. So they're on a, a three year uh, cohort cycle. So uh, it takes nine years essentially to, to monitor uh, one full life cycle of one cohort, meaning from eggs uh, to smolt to, to spawning. Uh, so it, it takes a, a long time to be able to monitor uh, the, the back and forth population dynamics. 
and uh, with one project uh, such as this, although there are many others in the watershed done by partnering agencies, such as the Marin Municipal Water District, uh, there's been a lot of work done in the watershed. And uh, despite that large amount of work, um, it can be very challenging to try to link a population number, uh, spawning number, uh, with one specific project. It's just they have a very, very complex life cycle uh, in the freshwater and the ocean. Uh, but what we do know is that we, we know that the, the habitats that we've built have provided habitats. We have empirical evidence that the, the, the stream channels that we've created, we know coho are using them. So that's, that's excellent evidence to tell us that the habitat that we have built uh, not only has the fish that we're trying to survive residing in it, uh, but also the habitat that uh, they use uh, is, is apparent throughout. So large, lots of large woody debris, uh, lots of streams with uh, channels with adequate velocities and depth throughout the winter. So um, until we probably have years and years of, of, of data, it can be very, very difficult to try to link one specific project with a, a spawning cohort. But, but using that, that empirical data uh, can be a really good, important step going forward. Well, great. Well, Preston, thanks so much that, uh, for that great presentation and really all the work that Turtle Island Restoration Network does um, to restore coho and steelhead and all these other species that you described. It's just really exciting project and really encouraging to hear the, the progress. So how about I'll go on now to say a few remarks. Can you stop sharing your screen and then I'll share mine? Hold on, folks, we'll get started. Um, before, I, um, before I talk more about the connection between sustainable conservation and the network, I'm going to do a brief overview of uh, sustainable conservation for those of you who are new to us. Um, we're a, we help California thrive by uniting people to solve the state's toughest environmental challenges. And for 26 years, we've engineered common sense solutions for managing California's land, air, and water. And we do this in ways that make environmental and economic sense. So we're always incorporating the perspectives and needs of all stakeholders, whether it be business, government, farmers, communities, government agencies, conservationists, and scientists. Our approach is to build partnerships by finding common ground. And we believe restoration projects like the one that Preston has just shared with us really should be easier and less expensive to implement. California needs thousands of these types of projects to ensure we have healthy populations of fish and wildlife species that make California a biodiversity hotspot in really such a special state. So I wanna take a minute just to review California's current situation. Ninety percent of California's wetlands and riparian areas are gone. And riparian refers to the, the trees and the natural vegetation along rivers and streams, like what you saw in, in Preston's photos. Two-thirds of our waterways are impaired, meaning they don't meet water quality standards because of erosion of sediment and or pollution. And over 350 species in California are threatened or endangered. Restoration practitioners like Preston or ranchers Mike and Sally Gale in this picture have to go to as many as eight different government agencies to get permits and sometimes more. And that's because restoration and housing development projects are treated the same under our regulatory system. Our environmental regulations were established for really important reasons, but they don't distinguish between restoration and development. Environmental regulations were put in place to prevent bad things from happening, and the unintended consequence is they actually also prevent good things from happening. So sustainable conservation has set out to put restoration on a separate path from development. We began this work at the county level, where we worked with local resource conservation districts to set up programs where all the regulatory agencies you saw in that previous slide issued permits to the resource conservation district for a set of pre-identified and needed restoration practices. 
Those permits then covered any landowners who worked with the district. We spent 15 years setting up these programs in 12 different counties, including Marin County. The programs were really effective at increasing the number of restoration projects because when the onerous barrier of having to go to eight different government agencies to get permits was removed, we found that the number of projects being implemented increased fivefold across these different programs. Really important projects got done under these county level programs and the environmental impact was, was really significant. So for example, in one stream in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County, they were able to remove all the barriers to fish passage. So opening up that entire stream as habitat for fish. But after 15 years, we were only in 12 counties and there are 58 counties in California. And the program was taking on average three years to set up and it really wasn't getting easier. So we took a step back, evaluated our progress and lessons learned and launched a much more ambitious initiative, which was to develop programmatic permits at the regional and statewide scale for commonly implemented restoration projects. So what is a programmatic permit? It's a little boring, but it's important. It's basically a pre-approved regulatory process for qualifying projects. So there are clear criteria and requirements in the terms of the environmental protection measures that have to be followed while implementing the project. And the applicant knows what all those requirements are in advance and submits all their information up front in order to be, improved, to be approved. If they meet the requirements, they're covered by the programmatic permit and don't have to seek an individual permit. We are now more than halfway through our initiative to simplify the permitting process with the major federal and major state agencies with jurisdiction over aquatic restoration projects. And we focused on aquatic projects because anything having to do with water, whether it's a river, stream, or wetland, is what really triggers the most permitting and regulatory review. It's also where some of the most important restoration work needs to happen. This slide shows what we've accomplished so far on the left and what we are currently working on on the right. So at the top on the left is NOAA Fisheries. We've worked with NOAA to establish biological opinions across the state. And a biological opinion is the programmatic permit Preston was able to take advantage of for his project working with the NOAA Restoration Center. All restoration practitioners in California with qualifying projects can have the very smooth and expedited process that Preston, Preston did. And in fact, 150 projects have taken advantage of it so far. The second agency on the left hand side is the California Coastal Commission. The entire coast of California is covered by a simplified process that actually meshes with that of NOAA fisheries. With sustainable conservation and NOAA's urging, the Coastal Commission agreed that if a project complied with NOAA's requirements, then it did not need additional Coastal Commission review, that that would be redundant. This was a big deal because as you can probably imagine, it's very challenging to get permits from the Coastal Commission, even for environmentally beneficial projects. And some of the most important restoration work to be done for fish are in the coastal zones. If you don't have healthy estuaries and good habitat in the mouths of rivers, what you do upstream is not gonna matter much. So working down the list, um, next is the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And in 2014, we were successful in sponsoring and getting passed legislation that created the Habitat Restoration and Enhancement Act which is a separate pathway at the Department of Fish and Wildlife for small scale habitat restoration projects. So, and by small scale, we mean under five acres and under 500 linear feet. These projects are now approved in 30 to 60 days, and they are linked to a similar permit at the state water board, uh, the last on the list to, on the left. So that brings us to what we're actively working on now. We're working on a statewide restoration program with the Army Corps of Engineers and statewide programmatic permits for that program with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the State Water Board. The State Water Board's involved because they wanna expand their expedited process beyond small scale projects so that they can encourage larger restora restoration projects as well. And we expect these simplified processes to be set up with all three of these agencies by the middle of next year. And it's really important to have simplified processes with all the agencies because any one agency can delay, can delay the process. So what kinds of projects are we talking about? 
In addition to floodplain restoration projects like the one Preston showed us, it will also cover projects like this one at Mike and Sally Gales Ranch on Chileno Creek in Marin. The photo on the bottom left shows the property when the Gales inherited it, and as you can see, the stream is denuded of vegetation. The large photo shows the results of an extensive revegetation effort. The trees they planted have prevented evaporation of the stream and also helped raise the water table. So now this stream that used to run dry in the summer runs year round with cool water temperatures, which are essential for fish. Steelhead trout now use the stream as do some 33 species of birds, according to monitoring by Point Blue Conservation Science. Another type of project that will be covered is removal of small dams and other barriers to fish passage. Tom and Manuela Bird removed a barrier to fish passage on their property in the Santa Cruz Mountains. The outdated bridge you see in the lower right-hand corner was a major roadblock to steelhead migration. During storms, debris got, gets caught in those culverts and prevents fish from passing through. And then in drier periods, the water flows under the culverts, which prevents fish from getting upstream. The bulky bridge and those undersized culverts also caused flooding during heavy rains, which eroded the stream bank and sent hundreds of tons of sediment downstream each year. So the new free span bridge you can see allows this imperiled fish unrestricted access to more than two miles of high quality breeding habitat upstream. So these are just a few examples of the types of restoration projects that are covered under the programmatic permit sustainable conservation is working to create with the agencies. In addition to individual funders, a very diverse array of organizations have provided funding for this programmatic permitting initiative because just about everyone wants to see more restoration happen in California more quickly. Whether it be California state parks who are currently not doing needed restoration because of the time and cost of getting permits or foundations that wanna help California preserve its unique biodiversity. So I wanna thank everyone who has provided support to our efforts. Simplifying permitting may not be sexy, but it is a highly leveraged strategy as it will support Turtle Island Restoration Network, many other nonprofits doing restoration, private landowners, and our state government. They'll be able to get projects done much more quickly with more money going to the actual restoration work rather than the permitting process. We estimate it's gonna save restoration practitioners 25 to 50% of their time and resources. So getting all these simplified permits in place will also mean that restoration projects that were not even being considered before also can get done. So with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Oops, I don't know what happened there. Let me stop that share. <laughs> And let me see, any questions? I'll give you a few minutes. I don't see any right now. There's one that's popped up. Um, is it okay if we are the kind of people, <laughs> this is a funny question. Is it okay if we are the kind of people who do find programmatic permitting sexy? Absolutely, you are, <laughs> we, uh, we would welcome uh, that. So thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments anyone wants to share? Okay, I see a couple more coming in. Um, what is the biggest obstacle to get the last three agencies on board, and I assume on board with programmatic permitting. Um, you know, right now, the Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the State Water Board are all um, very supportive and very enthusiastic about this process because they are all eager to see more restoration work happen, and they all um, realize that the current way of doing it is uh, doesn't make, it's just not time and cost effective. Um, this process actually saves government agencies a lot of time as well, which means that they can spend more of their time, you know, analyzing and reviewing projects that are gonna cause environmental ha harm as opposed to these. So right now we've, we've had a lot of support um, from the agencies. 
Uh, next question, where can I go to learn more about sustainable conservation and current efforts? You can go to our website, www.suscon.org. Um, you can learn about us under our, our work and it'll describe our accelerating restoration program. And then we also have a lot of information about the current programmatic permits available uh, on our technical resources section of our website. Is there a restriction for amount of linear work or acreage for the NOAA programmatic permit? Uh, no, there is not a restriction uh, on the amount of linear work or acreage. It has to meet other parameters, but they're not, um, they're not linked to the size. Uh, they're linked to uh, the assurances that environmental protection measures can be taken so that um, any kind of environmental temporary harm is minimized. And then another question, has programmatic permitting become standard operating practice in any agencies or with other groups supporting other types of restoration? Um, I'd say that, um, you know, for NOAA uh, Restoration Center and NOAA Fisheries, it has become standard operating procedure. They have really made great use of it and always turn to their programmatic permits when they can. Um, some of the agencies are still uh, the State Water Board actually uh, also uses theirs very actively, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife is increasingly getting more comfortable with using theirs. But there is a, um, some training that needs to be done to um, prepare both agency staff and restoration practitioners for using these programmatic permits well. So we hope to get there, and I'd say we're in process. Uh, another question, what percentage of the staff are scientists that you are dealing with for the last three agencies for programmatic permits versus operational staff with no science background? That is an excellent question, um, and I can't answer that. We're, I will um, need to talk with our team uh, who does all this great work, and I will get back to you. And Brenda, I see that's Brenda Christensen. So Brenda, I will, I'll send you a follow-up email. Um, another question, where can we find out more about the available programmatic permits for restoration? You can find out about all available programmatic permits for restoration on Sustainable Conservation's website, www.suscon.org. Go to our technical resources page and you'll see an accelerating um, restoration section and you'll, there'll be a link there to all the available permits. Great. Well, I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to go back to sharing screen and uh, close us up for the day or the morning. Hold on. I have just a few closing comments. Um, We hope you enjoyed the webinar, and we hope you'll join us for the next one, which is going to be in June. It's going to feature a panel of us and our partners talking about a new innovative technology that helps dairy farmers protect water quality and reduce greenhouse gases. So please do continue to check in and connect with our community through webinars, blog, happy hours on our website. There are plenty of ways to get involved and support our work. You can follow the link that's here on this page, suscon.org slash events. Um, and we'd love to hear your feedback. So please do take a few minutes to fill out the short survey uh, you receive after, uh, in the next day or so. And thank you again for attending. Um, we really appreciate your time. And until we connect next, stay healthy and take good care.